political stuff. Three, two, you know? one. We are. Ooh, you know what? What? We are live. He's still hung up on this rep. There we stuff. go. Three, two, you know? one. We are. Ooh. This is Jonathan Felt, broadcasting live from Utah, somewhere near Spanish Fork, Utah. And we have Buzz Eugene Richardson in the land of Zion, no less. How are you doing, Eugene? Better for hearing your voice. Doing pretty good. We now have the founder of Turkey. No, now we have Erdogan on the screen, and I've intermixed it with nice things like... A lamb ready to be sacrificed. And then we have the troops of Turkey coming on. Is there any uh, significance to this Turkey thing? Aren't they just a Turkey nation? Not worth much. Ooh, there's there's Putin and Donald Trump. Oh, wait a minute. Mormon Me Too, Sam Young. So we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, the Levites again and the reason I put up these images is because there's so much controversy going on here in the land of Zion it's uh, not like our father's land of Zion and certainly I don't think as Brigham Young saw it no I don't think so yep. not by a long shot so, anyway, um, as we were uh, talking, I did get some information from our friend in Missouri, in the land of Zion, out near where you are. In fact, uh, we were there. You saw the shofar come in with David Bronson, who played it on that uh, interesting day of Sukkot, or the beginning of it, or the ringing in of it from the evening we time. Are still in Sukkot, actually. And we still are in Sukkot. And that particular shofar was blown on the eve or the beginning of Sukkot, which marks the... Go ahead and tell them. The birth of our Savior. The true day of the birth of the Redeemer. Not the contrived day that everybody worships, which is the birthday of Baal or um, Tammuz or any of those pagan gods. So the birthday of Jesus can't happen in the fall because of the shepherds watching their sheep by night. Isn't that right? And the lambs that would be born in the spring. Lambs are born twice a year in the spring and in the fall. And uh, Sukkot happens during the time usually of the lamb, the, the fall lambing season. Okay. Uh, this is something city folks don't know. Yeah, that's true. I'm certainly a city folk. So let's uh, get started since we have such a uh, little bit of time. We're going to be talking about uh, chapter 207 of the Levitical Writings or the Book of Elias, Record of John, which was section 217 from March 21st, 1938. And I guess the title says it all, but it's got me wondering, I don't know if you can do this in a brief second, but why in the world are we <laughs> restoring keys to the Aaronic priesthood when that was done already in 1829, May 15th, 1829, every Mormon boy knows this date because we'd go on Aaronic priesthood outings and we would recite the date. We knew it like the back of our hand. So what about this restoration of keys? Why did we need it? Well, the keys were given to Joseph Smith. 
to restore it to the Lord's priesthood, but that was the Gentile church. And if you read very carefully, it says to never be taken off the earth until the sons of Levi offer an offering in righteousness. Well, that was given to the Gentiles to hold the Levitical priesthood because the Lord had his priesthood on the earth and all priesthood is Melchizedek. But the sons of Aaron hadn't stepped up to the bat. They still haven't. And to the plate, so to speak, uh, to do their job. So the Lord allowed the church to practice the Levitical priesthood temporarily until the sons of Aaron offer an offering in righteousness. But the sons of Aaron, uh, a man had stood up and he was preparing himself to be worthy to be the high priest of the Levitical priesthood and so the Lord restored it unto him. Hmm. But still, it needs to be fully restored. And that is the uh, man or the servant we named Maurice Glendening, who received this book of Elias. There was a book written um, in the mid-20th century, I believe, by one Blanche Beeston. She titled it, Now My Servant. And it was written in 1957, even before Maurice Glendening had passed away. But she chronicled or uh, made a history of this time just before coming to the restoration of the keys. And it was on March 21, 1938, that the figure of a man could be seen making his way over the scattered rocks and desert brush in the arid mountains of eastern Nevada. Nevada. Excuse me. He had uh, driven 10 or 11 miles in a westerly direction from Crystal Springs, a desert oasis in Nevada, parked his car to the right of the road, crossed the desert road, and began to climb the 150 to 200 yards to the first peak. I've been there. This man was the servant of the angel Elias. Angel Elias, interesting. The sun was shining brightly in the early afternoon hour, but the rising temperature was tempered by the coolness of the gentle spring breeze, making his climb pleasant and invigorating by the freshness of the new season. Budding life was bravely peeking through the drying soil, sod, which encouraged, uh, much encouraged by the precious moisture that had been retained through the winter days. Some days had forced their way through thin soil. Some uh, plants, excuse me, had forced their way through thin soil layers between rocks and opened their leaves to the warmth of the sun above. Kind of a flowery, you know, nice description of a desert scene. And as the servant reached the summit, the servant, they always put it in caps. I, I don't think he liked that, but maybe he did. Um, he could uh, better see the faulting formations in the area before him. He sat down on the large rock to rest from the climb and to ponder over the wondrous handiwork of God. Now, I've been there in the spring. It is a beautiful spot when the desert flowers are blooming, and it's very dry hill once the uh, summer gets going. And as the servant sat on his quiet and serene atmosphere, he thought of the many mercies God had extended to mankind how minerals were formed in the earth for man's use. Now, Maurice Glendening was a big rock hound, a geologist. Maybe he was uh, untrained. He was trained in many other areas, but I don't think he had a degree in geology. How man could take of the iron ores and work them into steel, steel to make needles, needles with which man could sew clothes and cover his nakedness. His soul was filled with gratitude for the great mercies of God for his children. In the midst of the silence came the voice, now long familiar to him over the years, the voice of the angel Elias. Immediately, the servant was in obedience to the voice speaking to him in recording the words which came. The uniqueness of his being on the top of the mountain was no hindrance. The voice of Elias had spoken to him under many conditions, but he was always able to record the words which were spoken. 
Yet there was something unusual about this occasion. This time he felt a pressure upon his head and was strongly impressed that there were others present about him. And that's when he recorded, or from uh, the words that he'd received, he recorded uh, in this section. So, um, is it possible for this angel, Elias, to apply pressure on the head of Maurice Glendinning? Oh, yeah. In fact, they're fundamentalists. I think it's in a Peterson group that make the same type of claim, saying that their supposed their prophet had the same thing happen to him. So you know, but the 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 point being, angels have hands they with pressure, seen or unseen by us, they still retain the ability to touch and move things and all of that. So. Well, and especially that if is a possibility. especially if Elias is John the Revelator, he can be invisible or he mm. can be visible. True. 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 Okay. Um, John more likely would be in the flesh. So John, if it was John doing it, he would have been in the flesh. Okay. So, do you think then? with uh, John the Baptist, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, that that was a vision they were seeing of a not-in-the-flesh uh, John, or was do you think John could have been in the flesh, maybe? No, he was raised and translated into... What a lot of people don't realize is there is a spirit that those that are righteous, not all, but those have been um, what most people would term resurrected, China is translated, uh, awaiting the final judgment, and their reason. Now, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're breaking up. I wonder uh, if you could walk to a more reliable spot that you know of. I don't know. By the way, you're seeing on the screen right now uh, wow. some of the scenes from that hill. And I'm going to switch over here to Zoom, and we can start with some of the things written. So a, a translated being or a resurrected being does have hands, does have a touch about them. Yes. Therefore, you would feel them, uh, but also uh, angels as well. So, well, you might not necessarily see them unless the veil is taken from you. But okay. they have bodies of flesh. So, yes. Interesting. Unto you, my fellow servant, in the name of Elias, so it's not saying I am Elias, we come holding all the keys and authority vested in the priesthood of Aaron. As you see on your screen, um, my friend in Missouri pointed out the chiasm in these first three verses. So you can see A, B, C, D, C, B, A is the way they work. So, and you being a son of Aaron, set apart and ordained in the spirit, and having come into the flesh by the will of the Father, we now place our hands upon your head and restore unto you all the keys and authority of the priesthood unto which you were ordained in the spirit to act in this authority with all the keys of the priesthood of Aaron as the first high priest of the order of Aaron. So what do you think of that? Is that consistent with what you know about scripture? Yeah. Alma 13 tells us that we were ordained in pre-existence before we even came to this earth. Okay, so there you go on that one. That's verse 2. The only thing I would add to verse 3 is in this dispensation, because there have been high priests, and, you know, so he's not the first, but the first of this dispensation. Um, in the name of Elias, we came holding all the keys and authority vested in the priesthood of Aaron. So that's an interesting statement. Yeah. Um, so it would have to be um, someone 
that was continuing, but their Aaronic priesthood, they're not Melchizedek like Peter, James, and John. Yeah. Uh, now, it could be John the Baptist, but he went to Joseph Smith. These could have been priests of... Um, oh, now Zadok. escapes me. Yeah, Zadok. These could have been the last rightful priests of Zadok, continuing the line of Zadok, you know, coming to one of that line and continuing it. He could have been ancestors the, the, of his. Exactly, exactly. Because they, they, it's very interesting how they worded that. They didn't state who they were, and yet they said they had all the keys, authority, vested in the priesthood of Aaron. They didn't say in the priesthood. They said in the priesthood of Aaron. So that would have been uh, people in the line of Sadak. Sure. Ordained in the Spirit, Alma 13. I don't know what the reference is in uh, RLDS. But, uh -huh. you know, number four it goes on and it says to confer unto those of the house of Levi this same authority and keys in part or in whole accordingly as may be appointed unto them by you. Now, they made a distinction, crossed a or put up a red line. There's a difference between Aaron and Levi. Do you happen to know what that difference is? Well, yeah, Aaron would be the priests of Zadok. Remember, Aaron was not the only Levite. Moses and Aaron were not, they were of one family of Levites, but Levi had a lot of other sons. And so the Levites were a whole tribe. Sure. But only the, the righteous sons of Zadok, descended from Aaron, hold the right to officiate in the temple and practice all the keys. Uh, now, Levites can do a lot, but the keys in the temple are only reserved for the sons of Zedek. So a Levite can, for example, do what? Uh, Levites can be bishops uh, in the, uh, the, and teachers and judges and law law givers uh, through the house of or through all the tribes of Israel. In fact, when God said, "I set aside people that the house of Israel must uh, support," He didn't just say the sons of Zedek. He said all Levites. They're sure. special into. So you know, if if all the tribes have Levites among them as priesthood. Ephraim, you know, we can rightfully or confidently say has Melchizedek priesthood when we're given it legally. Does a Danite and a Reubenite, do they have Melchizedek priesthood or some other priesthood? No, no, no. They, well, everybody is entitled to the Melchizedek priesthood Except Levites. Except Levites being set apart. Now that's interesting too, isn't it? So well, Levites are a tribe set apart. God said that. I take you unto myself, rather than asking the firstborn son of every person of every tribe, I'm taking the Levites unto myself as a special tribe. And you are to support give them their maintenance, give them their food. That's a covenant between God and Israel that Israel has not kept. It's interesting. To this day. We often say uh, Melchizedek is a is a greater priesthood, and therefore these dimwit, low life Levites, um, you know, have to obey us. But how stupid is that to say when these men are such set apart beings, such difference in a unique role? Well, you see, all priesthood is Melchizedek. In the beginning, there was no Melchizedek priesthood. There was only the priesthood after the order of the Son of God. And then they named it Melchizedek because Melchizedek was such a great high priest and to, to give reverence or deference unto the Lord. But then it was one priesthood still until Moses, and then it was split 
Why? That's the question everybody needs to ask. Why was it split? Because when one man holds priesthood, he can get all puffed up. Yep. Now you have two men with not opposing priesthoods, but with differing priesthoods, they're supposed to watch one another to make sure the other one doesn't go out of the way. And the Levitical priesthood was not given the the spiritual side. They were giving the physical side. So they had to do the sacrifices. They had to administer to the poor. They had to take care of the widows. They had to do all this stuff. And the Melchizedek was supposed to approach unto God and enter into his presence. But the problem is when men do that, and they think they've done that, they get all puffed up. Oh, I've seen God. You haven't. You've got to listen to me. Uh, come follow me, you know, <laughs> instead of come following the Savior. And the Leviticals are supposed to tap them on the shoulder and say, <clears throat> now here's the law God gave. Remember it. Yeah. If you and want to see God, you you better do this. Well, no, you can see God the first time, but if you want to continue seeing God, ah, you need to do this. This is interesting. You, but see, here's the thing. God lets us approach him. Then he watches us afterward to see how puffed up we get or how humble we stay. Ah. 99.99 get puffed up. Sure. The 1% of the 1% that stay meek and humble. Well, good. Then I have a chance. I haven't seen the Lord yet. Number five. And whatsoever you may appoint in the flesh or confer unto one of the house of Levi shall be appointed or conferred in the spirit. So that sounds like a ceiling to me. Yeah, well, you know, the Lord told um, uh, Alma in Helaman, whatever you seal on earth will be sealed in heaven. So whatever he did on earth is going to be conferred in the spirit or in heaven. This is saying that in just differing words. Sure. Okay, so this is still uh, admonishing Maurice Glendening. And whatsoever God has put together in the spirit, let no man in the flesh sever, save it be that in the worthiness of that one he may be found wanting. So it now, sounds like an excommunication or something if you sever it. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, God did everything in the spirit before it's in the flesh, and then everything in the flesh before it returns to spirit. And so if God proclaims something in the spirit, uh, you know, save it be in the worthiness of God, you may be found wanting if you sever, if you let it go. Um, so what I, God has put. It's not the ecclesiastical leader severing it, but it's the person that has received it severing it. No, it said, let no man in the flesh. Okay. So it could be either one. Okay, if God decrees something, and some man in the Melchizedek priesthood says, nah, that's not according to my understanding. Right. So what? The Melchizedek priesthood does not have any dealings in the Levitical priesthood when it's a Levitical priest setting apart a Levitical priest. Now, a Melchizedek priesthood has something to do with the Levitical priesthood. If there is no Levitical high priest doing it, then he can put a temporary uh, placeholder in there. But when it's Levitical priesthood, he has no authority. So if he s decides to sever something or say, no, that's not right, that's not acceptable, then it's a warning. Um, you know, save it be in the worthiness of the Savior you're going to be found wanting because the Savior wanted this. So essentially you're fighting against the Savior because of your opinion or your supposed authority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think I get that. So number seven, now let thy appointings be unto and among those who have been set apart by the patriarchs of the priesthood of Melchizedek only until those coming shall have been set apart by the patriarchs of the order of Aaron, yet to be established, and then shall they come from both. Interesting wording on patriarchs. 
Yeah. Yeah. You see, the patriarchs of the Melchizedek priesthood, which the church has done away with, the, the head patriarch of the church, uh, they're denying the patriarchal priesthood. They've neutered them into just men that give blessings, when the patriarchy is so much more. But anyway, a patriarch that has set up the Melchizedek priesthood, which they can no longer do because the church has done away with the office of patriarchs. And so the church has kind of cut off its nose and its willy-winky, so to speak, um, in their own supposed authority. But whatever they have appointed in the past, until the patriarchs come forth in the order of Aaron, and they have a righteous Sanhedrin or group of high priests that can appoint patriarchs to go out and do the checking on pay, on Levitical priesthood holders, let's say bishops. They they're like the standing high council that review bishops. Yeah, but they're they're ironic. They're Levitical because uh, bishops men have to be watched. Men cannot be a law unto themselves. When they are, they always go amok. So having a bishop of the Melchizedek priesthood doesn't do the watching, does it? No, Bishop of the Melchizedek Priesthood um, is a temporary office, and right now the church has so changed the the Bishop of the Melchizedek Priesthood, it doesn't even close to what the original Joseph Smith setup was. The bishop was to take care, was to do nothing but take care of the widows, the orphan, the sick, the afflicted, and the welfare needs of the church. Uh, now a bishop is um he's the you know he's in charge of ward priesthood and everything and every person in the ward is has to be deference to the pay deference to the bishop etc because he's a melchizedek high priest as well as a bishop so the lds church is saddled um priestly stuff with him and he's supposed to be teaching not only the the priest's quorum which is a bishop's responsibility but he's taking care or over the melchizedek priesthood in his ward etc cetera, etc cetera. they've overextended the bishop's calling to the point that he's never not filling anything really except being an administrator in the church so in verse 7 uh, let thy appointings be unto and among those who have been set apart by the patriarchs of the priesthood of Melchizedek. So patriarchs of the priesthood of Melchizedek, would that include the patriarchal priesthood that you spoke about before, that uh, once that yes. office is restored, then these patriarchs can be sending uh, Levites, it sounds like. Well, yeah, here's the problem. Joseph Smith, one of his last acts in this life, and most people don't know it, was setting up this patriarchal priesthood outside of the church. Now, most of the people that went to the Mormon uh, Utah church were members of this patriarchy, with the exception of two. And so they fall, fell in and followed the LDS way of doing things. Uh, because Brigham Young was their taskmaster. But the true patriarchs, um, they're supposed to, you know, help set up the Levitical priesthood. And that's what this is alluding to. But it says, only until those coming shall have been set apart by the order of Aaron yet to be established. Now, what I'm finding is some people of Aaron are trying to sidestep the patriarchs and Melchizedek priesthood and set up their own high priest and do all this, but then that would be out of order as far as God wants his kingdom to proceed. He wants his kingdom to be a kingdom of order, and it has to be rightly done in the manner of the priesthood. And both the Melchizedek and the Aaronic are both trying to sidestep that. So they're trying to avoid one another. And then shall they come from both? Do you think that's an ongoing and they shall come from both or only yeah. up until yeah. the order of Aaron is established? 
God says, says in the mouth of two or more witnesses, everything shall be established. So well, part of that. Give me an example of how you would foresee a patriarch of Melchizedek designating a Levite. Uh, by revelation, God revealing it to him and setting up uh, some patriarchs. Okay. See, here's the thing. Um, um, Moses ordained Aaron. You can read the process in uh, Exodus. And now the Melch and he was a Melchizedek priesthood holder as well as Levitical. So you had both in the one man. Uh, because he came from the house of Aaron originally. Nowadays, Joseph Smith, who is a pure Ephraimite, was given the Levitical priesthood by John and was told to set up and start the thing. Joseph was martyred before he got the kingdom fully established. Nowadays, we have still no Levites operating as Levites. And the church is supposed to provide houses and everything for Levites and the tabernacle. If you read in scriptures, it's not a temple that saves the people. It's a tabernacle. They have to do it in Nehemiah in the country they've been spread to. God says the only place on the earth that he, he allows a temple to be built legally to him would be Jerusalem. And if you can't do that, first build it in the country you're at. Well, if you can't build a temple, there's only one thing you can build is a tabernacle. And if you read in Isaiah chapter 4, the last verse talks about that tabernacle. In the day of the storm of the second coming of the Lord, the only place you're going to be safe is at his tabernacle. Didn't say temple. It said tabernacle. <coughs> so people, you know, not knowing the scriptures, being ignorant of it, don't know these nuances. You know, one thing I believe from the house of Aaron, their belief or their understanding of patriarchs of the priesthood of Melchizedek, are what you termed a neutered patriarch, one that has been relegated to giving <laughs> blessings, which has been for most of their, if not all of their history. But now we're opening it up to a different uh, reality of what a patriarch of the priesthood of Melchizedek actually is that would be doing this designating. And it makes more sense to me now because they'll be in all of these colonies of Zion that we've been talking about that are going to be spread throughout the land of Zion. So that makes sense. Well, there's one more misnomer. There's one more misnomer about patriarchs because of Brigham Young. And it, they have turned it, it patriarch into a dirty word. I think the only way you can be a patriarch is to be a polygamist. Right. And, you know, you have to have... Young's form of me to be a patriarch. Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. Now, Moses was plurally married. Noah, a patriarch, was plurally married. Um, there are other patriarchs that were plurally married, but Isaac was never plurally married. But Jacob was. And Isaac was a patriarch. Yeah. Jacob was. And so um, David you was. Have to, and you take Joseph. David was. But now there's a special scripture that say uh, a king shall never multiply wives. And David and Solomon both broke that scripture in the Torah. And then we have Jacob too that talks about their wickedness in plural marriage. And everyone says, oh, that proves that we can't be plurally married. Where the truth is, there were so many plurally married patriarchs, you'd have to throw them all out. You'd have to throw Jesus but Christ my, out. The whole thing here is not plural marriage. Jesus Christ was born yeah, through was one of those. Married. Well, all the people don't want to accept it. No, we don't even want him to be married. But, but yeah, but he came from the issue of a plural marriage, which was even that one of Bathsheba, which you know discredits him if if you're discredited right, polygamists. Right. So does all the house of Israel, obviously. That's right. Well, should we move but on? The point being, there were men that were and weren't. Yes, go ahead. 
All right. So number eight. So in other words, we don't believe a polygamist is disqualified from salvation, do we? No. Eight. And no, or a monogamist. Nor a monogamist. Because there are both sides of the camp on that one. Number eight. And so shall it be that our work may be in order, and that those of Ephraim may not deny our appointings, lest also they deny the patriarchs of the priesthood of Melchizedek. So, yeah, there's the, uh, that's that divide you were talking about. Everybody wants to uh, uh-huh. separate themselves from each other. So, Yeah, God keeps saying, I am one God, and if you're not one, you're not mine. You know, it's everything is one, one, one with God, and with man, it's divide, divide, divide. And who divides and conquers? That's Satan. Satan. So anybody that's in division is into Satanism, whether they believe it or not. It's true. Number nine. Now, when you bestow the keys and authority unto those of the house of Levi and Aaron, who have been ordained in the Spirit, it shall be thus. And then there's some uh, wording here. So let's test this against other scripture. And to you, my fellow servants, by the laying on of hands through the authority vested in me by the priesthood of Aaron, do I now restore unto you all the keys of the priesthood of Aaron, that you may again function in the house of Levi, accordingly as may be appointed unto you by the first high priest after the order of Aaron. And so may it be unto the glorification of the house of the Lord. Amen. What that sounds to me... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying, that sounds like a blessing from Aaron to this recipient. So if I was a patriarch of Melchizedek designating someone, I probably would have other words in a blessing, and then I would send them to the first high priest, question mark. Well, this blessing here, he has some problems. Okay. Um, I'm not saying it's not valid, but it sounds like a copy of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint mainstream Mormon blessing. Okay. Um, number by the priesthood of Aaron, the authority vested in me by the priesthood of Aaron, of all the keys of the priesthood of Aaron. Uh, function in the house of Levi. Okay, everything that's done has to be done in the name of the Lord and sanctified and sealed by the name of our Redeemer, Yeshua Yeshua, or Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. There's no mention of that. That's true. Okay, um, even in when uh, John the Baptist, in the name of Redeemer, Okay. Mm-hmm. He he okay, in the name of Redeemer, he didn't name the name, but he named the person in the authority. Sure. Uh here there's no authority listed. Oh yes, by the authority vested in me. Okay, and, and it's like an LDS blessing. If by the authority of the holy Melchizedek priesthood which I hold. Right. Um excuse Do me. Do I restore, yeah. The the yeah, it's I, I, I. Yeah. The Melchizedek, I mean, it, it, if you read in the New Testament, all of the scriptures are by the authority of the Redeemer, by the authority of Yahweh, by the authority of the God of, you know, of Israel. Uh, so, his is the authority. It's not ours. We may be allowed to hold it because... It was delivered to us, Yeshua HaMashiach, which we call Jesus Christ. But right. it's not our authority, and it's not Aaron's authority, it's, it's Yahweh's authority. Even now, Christ you're, said by the authority of my father. You are breaking up terribly, and that's, that's sad because we wanted to hear those comments, but uh, you are saying that these need to be done in the name of Jesus Christ or Messiah, Redeemer, Yahweh, uh, Yeshua, uh, Yoshia, and so on. And number, I don't know if you could walk to a uh, 
place that you're going to get a better reception, but sorry about that. And number 11. And How about now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, better now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the, well, you, you, you reviewed it pretty well, uh, but it's okay. So the, the authority issue here is one, but I'm not saying this is not a valid blessing, if you know what I mean. Sure. Um, the problem is when God gives a revelation, we tend to couch it according to our knowledge. Sure. And unless there's an angel standing there, you know, you're not going to get it verbatim. Sure. And, and uh, this Maurice Glendening did a remarkable job of writing down so many things. So he never mm -hmm. claimed to be a prophet. I don't think he had a uh, several clerks and several counselors as Joseph did as he was writing these down and perfecting these revelations. Well, you got to understand, Joseph would give a revelation, other people would write it, and then you'd have a third set of people cleaning it up for him. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, Glenn Denning, this is straight from his own personal pen, so he didn't have the filtering that we have from others. That's a very important distinction and uh, impression that you have there. Number 11, and you shall as shall those who shall come after you, exalt those of the house of Levi. For all this shall be from among those of the first high priests of the order of Aaron. So why do you think uh, that was said, exalt those of the house of Levi? Because uh, the Melchizedek priesthood is so stuck up with itself. <laughs> and thinks it's the greater priesthood, and Levi's the lesser priesthood, when actually... All priesthood is the same before the Lord. You're going back to the uh, breakup. Number 12. And that one shall honor his exaltation, that he may be found worthy unto the blessings of the house of Aaron, lest he fall into the forgotten. And unto this there shall be no bottom. That sounds like that scripture we read last week about the dissolved where you fall into the forgotten and unto this there yeah. is no bottom it sounds like uh yeah if you betray your covenants it's an important it's, it's it's as important as the covenants of melchizedek yeah well this one is where it gets real confusing because he's talking in a style that doesn't make sense to most um that you shall honor his exaltation and may be found worthy of the house of Aaron. Okay, right there. That part's easy. Lest he fall into the forgotten. That means he's, he's being set aside by God and not kept in the round of uh, progression, but put into outer darkness. Right. Where God forgets you. Right. And... In outer darkness, there's no height, no depth, no bottom, no no nothing. And God just kind of forgets you out there until you're humble. And uh, that could be for a long eternity. It kind of gets poetic here in O Forgotten, Where Are Thy Walls? This is the bottomless, the wallless, the endless, where eternity covereth it not at all. For God himself shall forget that one. And then we have this, Levi, awaken unto thy call, for thy soul shall not span that forgotten. Eternity goeth on where the forgotten cometh not at all. So that progression you were talking about, uh, he's cut off. And it, it even sounds like, a, Levi, awaken unto thy call. So... Don't ignore it, because yeah, even that. You, you can be cast off. Now, God never forgets anybody. We're all his children. But it seems that way. Sure. It seems like you're totally forgotten. You're totally abandoned. And he does. Uh, you know, it, it says when you're cast into outer darkness, 
the worm of their anger dieth not. Mm -hmm. So until you're totally purged of all that, God has nothing to do with you because he only deals with the meek and the humble and the contrite of spirit. So long as you hold on to your anger, so long as you hold on to your pride, you're in outer darkness and you're forgotten. That's basically, now he's writing that in his way, but that's essentially what it is. Well, this Elias was a poet. Uh, by the way, you're coming in very clear right now. And number 15, beware Ephraim, for where one goeth, another may follow. But in thy faithfulness and exaltation, thou shalt be glorified in the house of Aaron. Now, that's a weird statement. So I guess if you're Ephraim, I guess you can go and be forgotten too. That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. But in yep. thy faithfulness and exaltation, thou shalt be glorified. So it sounds like... Not only is the house of Melchizedek going to be throwing a party for you, but the house of Aaron is also, or something. Yeah, well, right now everybody's lost. Yeah. So Aaron, Ephraim, the whole house of Israel is lost. When Ephraim steps up to the plate to bat uh, and do what they're supposed to, because they've been slacking for a long time, and Judah has been, been being their pitch hitter, so to speak. Sure. Talking in baseball terms, but... The thing is, Judah has been taking up the slack of Ephraim a long time to the point that Judah thinks that they're now the royal house. But yeah. it's not till Ephraim stands up and does his job and remembers Levi. And then Levi's going to honor Ephraim for remembering him and then restoring all things as at first. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Now, um, speaking of witnesses, you do now. As far as I can tell from this account, there is no witness of it. So, here's what Maurice Glendening said in later pages of Now My Servant. Um, he said, and I went on for several years, and I had not even mentioned the fact that I had received these keys. As I remember it, it was never mentioned to a soul. I did not know even at the time that what the procedure and what the future would be. I believed with all my heart that God would see that things would develop and the various things to come forth in the future would come forth exactly as they should come forth. By the way, Glenn Denning was a very educated man. And I was willing to trust our Creator, believing that He would care for all things according to His will if I would be patient and wait upon the Lord. This is exactly what I did. Then nine years later, uh, his wife wrote this. About nine years later, in August 1947, in the early morning, the servant took his wife to the spot where he had received the keys of the Aaronic priesthood, reminding her she was the first to visit the place with him since that time. The first thing her eyes rested upon after reaching the summit was the small cross marking the rock upon which the servant sat as the keys were restored to him. After a time, they took pictures reenacting the occasion for photographic record. During this visit, Mrs. Glendening had a very wonderful and unusual experience. She had just taken three views of uh, the servant seated on the uh, stone upon which he sat during the angelic administration. Then she climbed down the mountain a short distance to get a front view and a larger background. She declares, While focusing the camera, I was astonished at what I saw. I looked up, but did not see what I had seen in the lens of the camera. I looked again into the camera lens and again saw what had previously astonished me. I saw two angelic beings in white flowing robes standing behind my husband with their hands extended over his head. I gazed so long into the camera that my husband said, Why don't you take the picture? I answered him by saying that I was wondering if I would take in the picture what I saw on the camera. He said, quote, You won't go ahead. You won't go ahead and take the picture, which I did. 
I then focus the camera again to snap another picture in the same position. While focusing the camera this time, I not only saw the two angelic beings standing behind my husband with outstretched hands over his head, but I saw a host of angelic beings that seemed to cover the mountaintop as far as the human eye could see up into the sky. Mrs. Glendening said what she saw in the camera was a still picture, there being no motion to the figures she saw. The camera seemed to act as a sort of Urim and Thummim to the scene which had taken place on the mountain on that eventful day of March 21st, 1938. Um, any uh, comment on that? You ever heard of any such thing? Oh, yeah. The Lord could, there is no time where the Lord is. And the Lord can reveal the same thing over and over many times to different people. So that's not, that's no big thing. I mean, it's significant that she was allowed to see it. But the fact that she did is not out of the ordinary. God can do a lot of things like that. Well, we wrap up another week. I hope you enjoyed this discussion of the restoration of the keys of the priesthood of Aaron. We are not representatives of the house of Aaron. We are not even members. But we love this book. It does reveal truth, and it reveals something that happened that's very significant to the building of Zion. Any uh, exit comment, Eugene? No, it's just that um, I honor truth wherever I find it. And so far, this book has reflected truth that's in Scripture. There are one or two things, like I, and like I noted tonight, that are not 100%, but that doesn't mean, because God doesn't hear according to his opinion, not ours. So, so far as reviewing this, I think I'm looking at truth. I feel truth here. As do I. Thank you. Thank you, David. So far from Zion.